consider complex numbers. Historically, the concept of complex numbers arose from the problem of solving of quadratic equations. Let's recall general form of a quadratic equation. It goes like this. a times x squared plus b times x plus c equals zero, where a, b, and c are constants. Roots of such equations are found by a well-known formula negative b plus or minus square root of d divided by 2a, where d is a discriminant of an equation found by the following formula. d equals b squared minus 4 times a times c. Now, as we know, if discriminant is greater than 0, then such equation has two distinct real roots. If d equals 0, then one real root. And for the third case, when d is less than 0, elementary math states that such equation has no real roots. Why so? Let's see. Let's consider an example. Suppose we have an equation x squared plus 4x plus 5 equals 0. Let's find its discriminant first. It goes 4 squared minus 4 times 1 and times 5. And that is 16 minus 20, which equals negative 4. So due to this formula, roots should be found like this. Negative 4 plus or minus square root of negative 4 divided by 2. We have square roots of negative 4 here. But wait, square roots are only defined for non-negative numbers. And that is reasonable, since notation of a square root is just a way to say that here we should have a real number, which gives negative 4 when raised to second power. But we definitely won't find such real number, square of which equals negative 4. So that is why elementary math says that there are no square roots of negative numbers. So, if square root of negative 4 has no place among real numbers, why can't we imagine another type of numbers containing it? And those crazy mathematicians actually did that long ago. They started with denoting square root of negative 1 as i, i for imaginary, and called it an imaginary unit. In fact, any other symbol could have been used to denote an imaginary unit, by, but i seemed the most natural to appear there. Now let's consider i squared. So it seems that we should simply take square root of negative 1, multiply it by another one, or raise to second power. And obtain negative 1. But consider this. This expression may also be given like this, which is also correct, but it is equal to square root of a positive 1, which equals simply 1. So we obtained a completely different result. And that makes us think that this whole concept is controversial. In fact, notation square root of negative 1 equals i is old-fashioned and not widely used, since it causes such misunderstandings. And it was only used for simplification and getting acquainted a little bit with the concept of i. Now, the proper definition of i is the following. i squared plus 1 equals 0. And therefore, i squared is equal to negative 1. To fully understand this, we should involve complex analysis and other tricky stuff. We won't do that. But for now, just remember this. Each time you run against a square root of a negative number, like we did in our example, we should immediately replace it with i multiplied by square root of the corresponding positive number. So we'll have i multiplied by square root of 4, which can be calculated. So we'll have i times 2, or simply 2i. Or in general, each time we have square root of negative b, where b is a positive number, 
it should be replaced with i times square root of b. Now, as we know how to deal with square roots of negative numbers, we can get back to our example and actually solve this equation. So we know that square root of negative 4 equals 2i. We can substitute it into an expression and obtain the following. Negative 4 plus or minus 2i divided by 2, which is equal to negative 2 plus or minus i. I symbol can be treated as some kind of a flag, indicating that the number standing next to it is of different, unusual nature. We could put 1 in front of i, so that it's clear that, it's, that it is also a number only of different nature. In fact, we could put an r sign next to negative 2, r for real, saying that negative 2 is a real number. But that makes little sense, because we are already used to real numbers. Despite being of different nature, such numbers can be added, subtracted, multiplied, or whatsoever. Addition and subtraction are no challenge. Let's consider a few examples to clarify that. Square root of 23 plus 1 
and minus 2. And again, we obtained a complex number. In fact, we could say that it has this much of imaginary part and this much of real. And the previous one had this much of imaginary part and this much of real. And the first one only had an imaginary part. The real part was missing, or equal to zero. And in these structures, as I already said, my symbol can be treated as some kind of a flag which tells that all the numbers enclosed in brackets are of different, unusual nature. They are imaginary. Or, as a factor, an imaginary number, which multiplied by these expressions, made these whole expressions imaginary. Unusual. So, one more time. A complex number is a compound of two numbers, real and imaginary. Imaginary numbers are recognized by an I mark used to identify them. The whole point of this imaginarity and different nature we've been talking about is the way how multiplication of such numbers is performed. Consider this. Suppose we want to multiply two imaginary numbers, say 2i and 3i. So we'll have 6 multiplied by i squared, and that, as you know, is equal to negative 1. So we'll have 6 multiplied by negative 1, which is equal to negative 6. But then, if we want to multiply an imaginary number, say 2i, by a real number, say 3, we'll have 6 times i. But look closely. We multiplied two imaginary numbers, but we obtained a real number. Their product was a real number. But then we multiplied an imaginary number by a real number and still obtained an imaginary number. And that is a thing to remember. Complex numbers are often denoted by the letter Z. So Z equals 25 over 4 times I minus 3, and that is a complex number. Real part of a complex number is denoted as real of Z, and in our case is equal to negative 3. Imaginary part of a complex number is denoted as imaginary of Z, and in this case is equal to 25 over 4. In general, a complex number may be given as follows. Z equals real of Z plus I times imaginary of Z. Now, we emphasized a lot that a complex number contains real parts and imaginary part. And therefore, it is convenient to represent complex numbers as pairs. Like this. Real Z and imaginary of Z. So the first number in pair stands for the real part, and the second stands for imaginary. So if we have z equal to 2 and negative 1, it is just another way of notation z equals 2 minus i. Remember that the order of numbers within the pair must be fixed. Otherwise, how can we tell which of two numbers stands for the real part and which is an imaginary? So, the numbers within the pair cannot be switched without consequences. Let's see what happens if we do switch them. So, suppose that this time we'll have z equal to negative 1 and 2 instead of 2 and negative 1. And that is another way of notation z equal to negative 1 plus 2i. So this seemingly minor change resulted into a completely different number. Considering real numbers, we're used to comparing them. So we can without hesitation say that negative 4 is less than 1. But how do we compare two complex numbers? And the answer to that is in no way. Complex numbers cannot be put in any sort of order and therefore we cannot say which, which of the two complex numbers is less or greater than the other one. We can only say that they have this much of real part and this much of imaginary. 
However, two complex numbers can be equal. That happens if and only if their real and imaginary parts are correspondingly equal. So, summing up. The main idea we should adopt after going through this video is that real numbers, the ones we are used to, are not the only existing type. In fact, we could create various types of numbers by defining rules for operations with them. And the only thing stopping us from doing that is lack of sense. While complex numbers are, are pretty sensible, they allow to calculate roots of even powers of negative numbers, and hence any quadratic equation has now a solution. Hopefully you are now acquainted a little bit with complex numbers. In the next videos we'll continue discussing them. We'll consider operations with them and their geometrical representation.